How you doing, Doc? I'm glad to be here talking with you, and it's good to see you. It's good to see you. Thank it's you. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, good news. Uh, I just got the results in from... Uh... Oh, shush up, Siri. Did you hear that? That was shocking. I've got, I've got no. spies. I've got computer spies on my computer. Uh, the good news is that uh, I just got in the results from the Meaning Wave Top 50 for January, and uh, you've obliterated the whole chart and uh, displaced Jocko Willink from the top. Oh, well, I don't want to take credit for that. That, that, that seems to be more your doing than mine, I would say. Um, <laughs> I, you could tell me a bit about Meaning Wave, you know. I mean, I, I know I've been associated with it, but I'm really quite ignorant about it, and we, we haven't talked that much. When did we meet? In L.A.? How long ago? I think it was L.A., wasn't it? It was in L.A., yeah, and uh, I took my son, you know, and I had my son. He fell asleep. Uh, after a little bit of your show, and that was an interesting thing. Oh, no, we didn't meet at your show, sorry, because I met Tammy. We spoke with Tammy afterwards, so I saw you there. And then uh, I, I was on your podcast a couple of years ago, I guess. Right, uh, okay. These things all are, are kind of mangled together in my mind, such as it is. So. Yes, yes. But, uh, you know, I did the first song, which would be the first Meaning Wave song, uh, sampling you talking about the virtue of being a good plumber in uh, 2017. We need to know who the competent people are, and we need to reward them. And even more importantly, we need to tell young people, hey, there's some hierarchies of competence out there. Like, a thousand of them. Go be a plumber, man. But be a good one, you know? Be an honest one. Because otherwise, all you do is go out there and cause trouble. We don't need people to cause more trouble. We need people to solve problems. Solve problems. We need people to solve problems. So this whole meaning wave thing, which is has now really been spiraling out of control, uh, has has been alive that long. You know, since, it's so now that's since when? Twenty seventeen. Twenty seventeen. Four years. And it was in February twenty eighteen that I decided I was going to do that hyper productivity thing. So it's nearly three years of that ex this extreme experiment in hyper hyper productivity and zone inhabitation that we spoke about. So what previously. is that experiment? Well that was the the idea of of you know getting in the zone and then not leaving. Mm -hmm. I'd seen so many bands, you know, their first album's amazing, right? So many bands. This is really I think we guitar bands. First album's brilliant, then the record company sends them on tour for two years. And they kind of, they fall out the zone. They've been in the, they were in the zone because they were practicing every day in the garage and da, 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 da. You know, everything they did was golden and amazing. Then they get out of the zone because they they go on tour, they get disrupted and they can't find their way back in, you know? Yeah, well, it's very unlikely that you get there to begin with, you know? I mean, yes. most people have zero hit records. Yes, exactly. So and, uh, even if you've most had people one, have, it's unlikely yeah. that you'll have another. Quite, you know, how many most bands release three records, right? And mm. uh, I believe we released 19 last year, you know. Um, and what I've discovered since I've been doing this is it really has been working, it just each thing is better than the previous. Uh, every experience is just a bit more glittery and magical and salient and smooth and, and, and all that. And uh, now, three years into it, here we are, and just did uh just did another record uh with you <laughs> and uh it's wonderful and everybody loves it and it's decimated the meaning wave top 50 uh casting alan watts out into the outer reaches of the 20s and uh all that so so yeah it's, it's people love it people love it very much uh people were very very we haven't done one since 2019 and what was crazy mm. was uh, i started making the new one and i'd been working on it for four days and then you posted your comeback video and I thought, well, if that isn't uh, magical, because uh, well, remember I was telling you last time, one thing I've been doing in this sort of hyper productivity thing is uh, not stopping to think about things too much and just treating synchronicities as signposts that I'm going in the right direction, you know? Yeah. And, every, and that's just what I've been doing for three years now. And every time I do a project, there'll be some ridiculous synchronicity like that. So it does seem that, you know, we're going in the right direction. And what kind of audience are you attracting for your endeavors? And and is it all online? Do you do any of this live? Uh, like I said, well, I'm I mean, ignorant about all this. Not now, obviously. 
Well, as you know, I mean, we're, everybody's kind of indoors right now. You mm -hmm. know? And um, so I was outside. I was DJing in nightclubs in Los Angeles, uh, you know, f up to five nights a week. And uh, and I had Meaning Wave fans coming down and, you know, they'd, they'd, they'd burst into tears and stuff. And it was beautiful. This uh, little Latina girl came down and uh, with all her friends and just like was crying because uh, Meaning Wave had saved her life. So those things, sorts of things were, were occurring. And then then, you know, uh, Tom Hanks came to town with his filthy disease and everyone had to stay indoors. So we pivoted immediately to just DJing live uh, on the internet twice a day. I'd have been doing that for nearly a year now. And, uh, and that's a wonderful thing. And uh, we have a wonderful community uh, who are there every night and they've all made friends there and relationships and people are getting married and things of that nature. And, uh, and that's all very wonderful. And, uh, you know, as as we move into the new world that's currently being built, we will step outdoors again and, and take this into the world and it will be wonderful. And uh, at some point we will have our Meaning Wave Festival, Mazdoc or Meaning Fest or whatever we call it. And uh, obviously you'll have to come down and uh, I'll live score uh, a lecture and it will be wonderful. So the the online DJing you're doing, is that Meaning Wave based as, as well? How much of your musical output is centered around Meaning Wave? Well, Meaning Wave is because, you know, I make so much of it, releasing so many records. I'm now at the point we've got uh, like 400, nearly 400 records, I think, um, individual songs just on Spotify and streaming services. Uh, 400. And lots more. I think mm. so. Uh, with, you know, new ones coming out all the time. So a problem that some DJs have on the internet is uh, with algorithms, uh, copyright algorithms and what have you, they'll get booted off for playing copyrighted music, whereas we can play our music for hours days and have no problems uh but i do a balance of uh of playing sort of meaning wave live shows of playing dj sets that are like club sets of other people's music or rock sets or all sorts of things and then i've been doing experimental things like live scoring lectures so what we've been doing on wednesdays for the past few weeks is uh live scoring your biblical series for example i think the punishment that god lays on cain is it's like the inevitable consequences of Cain's action. It's something like that. It's like, well, he killed his brother. There's no going back from that, man. Like, good luck forgiving yourself for that. Uh, so playing that and then live scoring it, like playing music, accompanying it, and sort of, which is a very, very intense thing to do because you're you're kind of almost playing a weird kind of instantly reactive chess where the inflection of of the voice indicates that you want to be moving in this direction musically in order to correctly match what's happening. And you're a bugger because you will go from uh, from saying something that's making everybody cry to cracking a joke in the space of about 32 seconds. Uh, so to correctly match that musically is quite the thing. And uh, it's an incredible uh, thing to be doing and doing that and exercises like that for the past year has really uh, taught me a great deal, you know. Going from being in clubs where you can see people and you can really feel what it is that they need in order to take them on the right kind of transcendent journey to doing it on the computer. I wasn't quite sure when I started if it was even possible, you know, but it yeah. turns out it is. It turns out you can uh, feel out your audience on the computer and, and still take people on a transcendent journey across, you know, space and time. It's quite a thing. And what kind of audience numbers are you getting for something like real-time scoring of a lecture of all the strange uh, real, things to do <laughs> yes it is strange things to do mm -hmm. uh it could be up to thousands uh there's usually at least a hundred odd people at any given time and then they attract thousands of views over over the duration uh of the thing and this is twice a day every day that this is going on and uh as far as the music is concerned uh last month we had i think it was just over two hundred thousand people just on Spotify, uh, listening to Meaning Wave. Uh, you know, the album we just put out with you, like, was it one, two weeks ago? That's already done a quarter of a million streams uh, just on Spotify. Do you get any coverage from, I hate this phrase, but the mainstream media? No, no, no. They've completely ignored us. It's funny, I used to get coverage. And then the second uh, I put out a record with you, the whole bunch of people just completely like... <laughs> I had a few nasty letters and then a complete unplugging. But what's funny is that all those chan all those places, we do bigger numbers than the things they're writing about. Uh, hmm. Like, well, like I'm quite sorry a lot. that I've been, I've been, I've been bait and poison at the same time. I guess, eh? 
Well, here's the thing, you know, I I divorced myself from that whole world in a way anyway, you know, uh, and I've been talking about this for quite a while, you know, uh, it's a, it's a den of vipers and snakes and horror. And, you know, it's, it goes out of its way to uh, manipulate things into being, shall we say, like less useful and good than they could be, you know? Mm -hmm. So I was in the, I've been in the process of building my own music industry since like 2008 you know, and then meeting wave was the thing that brought it all together, I would say. And, uh, and you know, that's, that's happening all over the internet with everything, right? Yeah. Like everyone's building their own worlds and their own things outside of these old traditional structures and these old traditional structures are just dying noisily. Uh, that, that certainly seems to be happening noisily, painfully, cruelly. Um, cruel is, although it's amazing to me, like observing, you know, as, as always, whenever, you're around it, like their recent uh activities with regards to you it amazes me that they're always so eager to promote your books well you know, i i really they go out of their to way to understand any of this <laughs> it's complete mystery to me i mean it, and part of the mystery is also your activity with meaning wave i mean it was certainly nothing i ever expected and i've been watching it curious with with intense curiosity because it's it's i because it's so different and unexpected and i mean people seem to be responding to the music very positively i read the comments on your website you know now and then just to kind of keep an eye on especially when you send me notification of a new release and i listen to it but i don't know what i can't evaluate it you know because it's so shocking to me that it's my voice and my words and so i have no idea what to think of it i don't know what an that's why I'm interested in the public response. I can't tell if I like it or not, you know, because I'm way too close to it. I could say the same thing about everything I produce for that matter. You know, not that I'm producing this, but I'm definitely involved in some strange manner. So, but well, it's good. Like, I think you could tell the effect on like people it. seems to be very positive. So, uh, and why do you think that is exactly? And what do you think it offers to people as opposed to say, one of my lectures or even a short clip. What's well, I mean, going I was, on I here? Was gonna ask, I want to know. I was going to ask you the same question. I have my theories and, uh, you know, obviously the combination of music and speech is an incredibly powerful thing. And, you know, I, I discovered this when I was a little kid, you know, when I, the, I quit school when I was like 16, but I left home the day before I was 16 after an argument with my father, which I, I learned is similar to you. And, uh, the last thing I did in my in exams was, uh, I recorded my notes over ambient music and played them as I went to sleep. And I found that I remembered things that way. And I find if you take bits of speech and you turn them into these little songs, you can really, really uh, imbue them. You know, you can really integrate them and you can listen to them forever. You know, you could, how many times could you listen to a podcast? You know, once or twice. Not even once. How many once. times could you listen to it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, on, on twice speed with you sounding like a chipmunk or whatever. Because mm -hmm. you know? you've talked about this, you know, this incredible thing now, you know, More not like everybody can read. like an electrocuted frog, <laughs> apparently. Apparently. Frog uh, on amphetamines. Yeah, there you go. That's your new, mm -hmm. uh, that's your new logo. Yeah, uh, I might as well make a drug joke. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Right, so. A weird world, Kira. It's a beautiful world, right? It's a magical, magical, incredible juncture. It's, uh, you know, one one direction, there's Mad Max world. Over there's Star Trek Next Generation world. And over there's some unholy alliance of Brave New World in 1984 and all of those horrible things. And any one of them, we could be plunging right into it any second, or maybe we're already there. And it's incredible. But but just to get back to that, you yes. had that, you noted that uh, this incredible thing about, you know, audio and found time, right? And not everyone can necessarily read or find time to read, but they can all listen. Yeah. But not necessarily everyone hasn't got time to listen to a two hour podcast, but anyone can listen to a three minute pop song. Yeah. Well, that's listen to that three minute pop song a so, hundred times. That's one of the things that's one of the many things that's so interesting about YouTube is that any content is fractionable down to any length of time and no one knows what the optimal length is. I suppose the optimal length is the one matched for the particular demands of the audience at that time. So one minute is good. 30 seconds is good. Three minute has its function. Five minutes has its function. And, and so, and YouTube allows for the 
repurposing of content over and over at all those different at, at all those different levels of fractionation and then you've done something different again with the music and well you saw what happened with on tiktok recently right probably not no i'm i'm remarkably sheltered from the world actually all things considered and it's a good it's a good thing <laughs> i suppose because whenever make. i make a foray out into it i um all hell breaks loose so that's one of your special talents you apparently know, people love you I guess yes, um, which is an amazing thing in and of itself as well. So, well, um, what was wonderful recently is yeah. uh, one of the songs from our previous record, uh, the JBP Wave Father album, which is all about you know all those patriarchal ideas and yeah, and uh, that people love so much. Uh, the last was it the last song from that? A song called Art, where you talk about art being a you know a portal to the transcendent and the divine, uh, blew up like crazy on TikTok. But it's really, it's unbelievably worth it because it it opens your eyes to the domain of the transcendent. That's the right way of thinking about it. A real piece of art is a window into the transcendent. That's what it is. Oh, yes, I do over remember 14, that. 000, you sent me yeah. that link. 14,000 TikTok videos ge generated to that yeah. piece of music. Right, that's really remarkable. What is it, 10 or 15 seconds? So you were talking about like, optimal time length there. They took this 15 second bit where you just art uh, is a portal to the transcendent and the divine type thing. And uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of these people creating art and using that music to it. And they're making paintings and they're getting tattoos and they're doing eyeshadow. And, and a whole huge lot of these people are supposed to be people that hate you, incidentally. Mm -hmm. And obviously don't seem to hate luckily, that much that even noticed. So Well, luckily, not as many people hate me as should hate me. Uh, well, I think that it's seems more to that, be the case. I think that the that world is a distortion, you know? People go on Twitter and they're, you know, it's such a it's such a cliche, but it's not the real world. You know, it's not even close to the real world. It's just this tiny little bit of it. And but there's all these all these millions of people over on all these other places and they're doing things like making art and having a wonderful time doing it and uh, taking this little 15 second clip of an Akira the Don and Jordan B. Peterson song, because that's what really says what they're trying to say, or is close to it, uh, mm -hmm. you know, because this is something I wanted to ask you. Uh, music seems to do something that other things cannot. What, what, what do you think that is and why? Well, music gives you a direct intimation of meaning. And it's incontrovertible. You can't criticize it away. Like even people that, even people who are explicitly nihilistic in their philosophies, you know, insofar as you can be explicitly nihilistic and still be alive, they'll listen to music and music transports them into a domain where they experience intrinsic meaning. And what, what are you going to do about that? You can't criticize it. You can't say it doesn't exist. You can't say it isn't real. And I think it's, it's, it's unbelievably real from my perspective, partly because music presents, inter, presents um, harmoniously interweaved patterns. And the world is made out of patterns. Now, they're not always harmoniously interweaved. But in music, you get a tremendous range. So it can be discordant as well. Interestingly arranged patterns, I suppose, is more accurate in relationship to music. And the world is made out of interestingly arranged patterns. And so music is actually the most representative form of art, as far as I'm concerned, rather than the least representative. It gets right down to the core of the matter. And we do experience whatever meaning life is capable of generating by participating in those patterns. And that's what we do when we're dancing. We pattern our body to the patterns that we're experiencing. And that's a that's an example of us pattern, patterning our body to the, to, the, to, the, to the patterns of reality itself. We play at that, and then we do it with other people, and that's, a, that's, that's like the basic, that's like the reconstruction of a basic society. We have the patterns going in the background, that's music, and then we match our bodies to those patterns, and we do that socially, and then we produce a little microcosm of society right there and then. We're playing that out to what end? God only knows, but it's part of the culture creating facility. And then, of course, music, part of our language is music. So, roughly speaking, in left handed and right handed people, anyways, the right hemisphere keeps track of the melody of language and the left hemisphere keeps track of the semantic content, but we derive meaning from language by analyzing the semantic content. So that's the meaning of the words themselves and the phrases. 
but also a lot of the emotional tenor is carried by the melody of language and the rhythm of language. And I tend to speak rhythmically, oddly enough, which is partly why you can do what you do with my lectures. And, and I'm very much attuned to music. Whenever I write, I always read my sentences out loud, listening for the rhythm and the harmony. And if the sentence doesn't perform musically, then I reconstruct it. And that makes reading my books aloud a lot more, a lot more straightforward, a lot simpler uh, when I do an audio recording of them, an audible recording. So, so music is music. Music allows even people who are a religious to have a religious experience. Just it's right at the at the palm. It's right in the palm of their hand. It's right there. All you have to do is listen to a song, and there you are, imbued with meaning. And 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 so our interaction with the patterns that constitute reality is a meaningful interaction. And music signifies that and reminds us of that constantly. And so, and what I love about it is that it's 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 outside the domain of rational criticism. You just can't say, well, that's it's stupid to find that meaningful. It doesn't matter if you say that. You can't destroy it with with a verbal critique. You can't destroy it with a caustic philosophy. And that's part of what people love so much about music. I people. I don't see how human beings could live without music. I don't think we could. Die without music is like, music is everything. Music is everything. Music is everything. It's interesting the, uh was it Frank Zappa said, uh, writing about music is like dancing about architecture. And uh, critics for years would try and tear down certain kinds of music and say, oh, I, really, I, I was always very anti this term guilty pleasure. You know, guilty pleasure, that's like, you know, if you've, if you've cost someone their job or you've caused someone to commit suicide or something, right? If you're taking pleasure in something like that, you should feel guilty. The idea of feeling guilty about liking music because it's, deemed uncool by some someone is just bizarre what if it's abba abba's wonderful right <laughs> i'm kidding some of the most it's a incredible guilty pleasure of mine well people say right but some of the most incredible experiences i've seen in nightclubs is when i've been in like hardcore rap clubs and then i've played dancing queen mm -hmm. and people go in they're just so happy you know mm. this because you've had this quite intense or like different there's different obviously these different uh flavors and sort of uh shades of rap music uh, but if you may be in a sort of trap type of direction, which could be quite dark and hard, and then tempo-wise, you could put in Dancing Queen, you have this incredible transcendent rush. And particularly every female in the place just goes insane. And if females go insane, then guys go insane. But guys go insane anyway, because guys really love ABBA, really. You know, everybody does. So you do that. And then you put a beat back on top of that, of that song right at the end. And that's kind of made it okay. So they've had this little moment of release. You know, if you went straight into like then playing YMCA and a bunch of other stuff, then the illusion would kind of fall apart and people would get self-conscious, you know? Right. Uh, if you allow people these little flashes of, uh, of release and this, you know, I don't know why Swedish people, by it's the way, very are so smart. good. It's very that. smart is that you bracket it so that the irony, that people can't use irony to destroy the experience. I mean, ABBA, they were geniuses at melody. Their arrangements yes. leave much to be desired. So repeated listenings tend to be, to get hollow, but they're unbelievably catchy and their m melodies were incredibly, um, well, they're beautiful and they're, and they're unbelievably accessible. And, and so more power to them as far as I'm concerned. But I think it's really, it's really something to bracket that with acceptable music so that people can enjoy it without becoming ironically self-conscious and destroying it all. It's the thing I do. I'm very, it's the thing I've always done. It's very um, smart. It's very smart. If you don't mind Tell me, me this. so hang what on. Was it, what music did you enjoy as a as a young person? Um depends on how young. My Do you remember I'm, the first I'm, I'm record? A, you I'm ever a seventies dinosaur rocker fundamentally, you know. I mean, uh -huh. I listened to Pink Floyd and Led Zeppelin um uh -huh. constantly when I was 13, 14, that's probably when I started to get really interested in music. Um, I think the first album I listened to really deeply was, 
one of the first was Neil Diamond's Taproot Manuscript, which is a very underappreciated uh, piece of work. I think it's it's great. It, um, it's very well arranged, unlike a lot of his later material. Neil Diamond was also very good with the melody, but his arrangements were often very much lacking. But this Taproot is the second time you've brought this up. So let me know, what would you say is a good pop song arrangement? Um, this all is something this, people really don't even think about anymore, by the way. Super Tramp's Crime of the Century is uh -huh. unbelievably arranged unbelievably well. Dark Side of the Moon is arranged unbelievably well. Um, let's see. Well, I mentioned Taproot Manuscript. I mean, if if the arrangement is of high quality, you can listen to it over and over and over and over because you can track different parts of the melody. So each instrument is doing something different. Mm -hmm. And so if the arrangement is complex, you can you can get the benefit of the melody and the catchiness of the melody, I suppose. But you because it allows for infinitely different ways of listening to it, because all the instruments are doing different things, you never get sick of it. You never exhaust it. Well, and then there's classical arrangements. Uh, Bach's Brandenburg concertos, I think, are, 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 are the best example that I know of, of and I'm, I'm no expert in the domain of classical music, Baroque music in that particular case, but Bach's Brandenburg concertos, especially the third one, they're, the arrangements are just, they're, well, uh, sacred, heavenly. Um, what else? I Lately, I mean, there's, so I listen to a lot of 70s rock, all the classic rock I really like, but my musical taste really expanded when I was in my, late 20s and 30s, and I started to listen to every genre I could get my hands on. So um, I really like, there's lots of old country music I like. I like country swing, which was a real niche genre back in the 1930s. Um, I like, there was punk rock I liked. Um, I've never taken to hip hop or rap. It's just too far, it's just too far away from me culturally. There's, um, there's a, there, with certain exceptions, there's a rap song that Tom Waits produced a while back or was involved in. I really liked that. Really? Unfortunately, I can't remember it. Comes, it has a great video associated with it. I, there's a lot of modern bands, well, modern for me, that, that I like as well. I, I love Arcade Fire. Uh -huh. uh, I think that uh, I think they're great. Broken Bells, I liked a lot. Um, I unfortunately haven't been able to listen to music much for the last two years because I've been, my senses, my hearing has become hyper acute. And so it's quite painful to listen to. And it's real loss. It's real sad really? loss for me because I just love music. So, say la vie. There's uh, something that really kind of blew my mind because I didn't find out about it until quite late into the game. Obviously, uh, the, the, the music I make and the company I've built and all this is called, and the sort of psychotechnology as we're considering it is called Meaning Wave. And it was born from one song in which I sampled you talking about the benefit of being a good ass plumber, right? <laughs> Doing something properly, uh, mm -hmm. you know, which came up flash. I come back from DJing, it was three, four in the morning. I'm trying to decompress after entertaining all these lunatics jumping up and down and YouTube brings on this lecture review and there's just this bit of it that's incredibly salient and glittering when you say, be a plumber, be a good one, you know? I'm like, shit, I have to turn that into a record. Why? Anyway, that, that why? Birth, why? Why did that strike you? Why did it strike me? Mm -hmm. That's the question. Why did it strike me? It was just That is the question. That's the fundamental question always. Why does something strike you? And because what is it that's striking you? That's the it's question. It's always a case of something that you think and you've and you're, you've tried to say maybe, and you haven't ever quite been able to sum it up properly. And then someone says it. What you said there, I tried to say in one of my first, after I got signed to Interscope back in 2005, I did a quite a big interv uh, interview and someone was questioning me and I was, I was trying to explain that point, but I said it kind of wrong. I was like, I was said, oh, I don't see why like a, a road sweeper who's really good should get paid any more than a rock star and it came out sounding like some kind of sort of like socialist sort of jibber jabber right, that's not what right, i meant but right. i hadn't really thought it through properly and then when i mm -hmm. saw you say that what you did was there crystallized something i'd been thinking about for decades really you know yeah. so it was glittering well, so that's was... like providing the punchline to a joke you know it, it 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 crystallizes it crystallizes and makes explicit what's still implicit so yeah. that's so that's one reason that things do strike you, like the punchline of a joke. That's one me. reason. But, but then, you know, the this whole is... this whole issue of being struck by something is unbelievably important, and that's another thing that's so interesting about music because music strikes you. 
And so then the question is, well, why does it attract your attention? What's it doing? And that's been a great mystery for me. That's been something I've tried to unpack for a long period of time. And you know that that painting I made, sculpture painting, it's about this thick and made out of 20 levels or so. That's what I was getting to. Music. Yeah, well, I worked on that for about three months and I had a religious experience when I finished it. I was looking at it gazing at it because it's called the meaning of music and it was an investigation that I had conducted into the meaning of music trying to represent it graphically because the painting shifts and moves as you look at it and I was looking at it and listening to Mozart's 40th symphony which is the Jupiter symphony maybe the 41st I don't remember it's the Jupiter anyways and all of a sudden like it was like the heavens opened up and 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 I was over, it was like, you know, the experience you get when you listen to a piece of music that's deeply meaningful. It was like that on steroids. And and uh, it was one of the most powerful experiences of my life. And I got some insight, deeper insight into music's link to the, to the I suppose, to the transcendent realm. That's one way of thinking about it. But it's, it's not precisely transcendent because the patterns that the world is made of are right there. They're real. And music speaks of that. And you know, you, you, you find something, for example, maybe when you're going through my lecture, something attracts your attention and that's not voluntary, right? It just happens to you. And then you can notice that and you can think, wow, I think that's meaningful. Like that strikes me as meaningful. It's, and that's a guidepost. You talked about synchronicities earlier, mm-hmm. but the experience, the spontaneous experience of meaning is a guidepost. And you can think of that as something that can orient you in the world, or you could, that's part of the world, or you can think about it as a manifestation of your own unconscious mind. It doesn't really matter, but something's orienting you to something that's maximally, what would you say? That has maximum possibility in the world. And what's so interesting about that is it's not voluntary. It happens despite you. And I don't know what to make of that, except that there's something operating in reality that produces meaning in us that isn't us. And I think that's the root of the religious instinct. You call that God. Well, you got to call it something once you notice it's there. And you can't dispute this as far as I'm concerned. You know, you can try to make yourself meaningfully interested in something that you're not meaningfully interested in, and you won't do it. You can't control that. It has to happen spontaneously. And, And again, that means that something outside of you is running the show. Very, very strange. Uncanny. This is, I think, that's, I think, what uh, Joseph Campbell was talking about with his folly or bliss thing, which some people get confused, I think, and think it means, you know, just like do the thing you like or whatever. Yes, well, thing, I, like, I do think eat a that's bunch of ice you, cream. I agree. You know, I'm, I like Jung's formulation better because Jung noted that if you follow that, it will likely take you to a very dark place. Like it'll take you to the realm where there are things that you have to where the things you have to encounter but have avoided dwell. And that can be, well, you avoided those things because they were frightening to you. And so when you encounter them all at once, that's no picnic. So that's why the bliss formulation isn't right. It's always been interesting to me because I've seen you bring that up on a couple of occasions. And I did some, you know, I did some looking into his stuff. And it's interesting because you were both kind of looking at similar source material and coming up with somewhat slightly different conclusions perhaps but then i think that is what he was talking about i think he was talking looking well the way i was saying when you look for that thing that glitters to you yeah and then the deeper you go into that then the more of that you will find and you keep going down that road it's a kind of this pathway uh and if you kind and of i think that honestly i think that's literally irony, true mm-hmm. yeah if you follow that then you have more and more of that for good it's not surprising really in some sense um what you'd expect to have less and less of it if you followed it (laughs) so mean music opens a window to that it's like oh look i can have a spontaneous experience of meaning i wonder why well i associated it with patterns it's like well the world is made out of patterns and so is music and so music speaks deeply of the world and it forces you into alignment no it it it, it entices you into alignment with the world, which is why you you almost uncontrollably dance. My 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 son's son is like eight months old now, something like that. Maybe not quite that old. You'd think I'd know, but I don't. Um, 
he, in his jolly jumper, he spontaneously dances to music. It, even at that young age, yeah. he finds himself compelled to align his body with the patterns of the world. And so you see that that meaning can be produced spontaneously by an art form and all art, all art strives to produce that. But music, I think, does it most effectively, certainly does it for me most effectively, even though I'm also quite sensitive to visual art. Um, so then you think, well, meaning is a reality. And then that starts to realign the way you think it's a reality. Okay, well, what does that mean exactly? Is it, and I, I suppose it's the ultimate reality. <sighs> That's probably the case. Me music speaks of the ultimate reality. And maybe that's what you should be searching for. That's what you have as a defense against the terrors of the world. And that's why I think people can't live without music. Literally. We can't, we can't do without it. It's why your experiment is so interesting to me. And well, you've, you've read, you read the comments, right? Uh, and that's all, that's what everybody, that's what people say. And some of them are quite shocked. And, uh, you know, some of them had, had had all sorts of awful experiences and awful kind of ideas of what the world was. And then the music showed them this other thing, this thing of which you speak, this thing that's actually the, the, the truth of the matter. And allowed and gave them, yeah. And gave mm -hmm. them permission uh, to, to walk in that, into that light, so right. to speak. Cause even so punk rock did that. Oh, that's what I loved about it. Um, you know, you could take the most nihilistic, aggressive, um, disaffected, resentful people and they'd listen to the punk rock and it would entice them into a relationship with meaning. <laughs> and it's, it's so interesting to see that. It's great. Yeah, well, it's, that's kind of a bit of a disaster about, uh, you know, all the festivals shutting down and all the nightclubs and things shutting down and all that type of thing for the past year. That's years. for it's, sure. It's really removed that. And that's why it's so important what uh, a lot of people have been doing with you know, making these things happen on the internet. So there's been this thing that's sprung up on Twitch of just DJs going on Twitch and building these communities. And uh, you can go on Twitch now, which was a gaming platform, and any kind of music you're interested in, you can find pretty much the best DJ on earth playing that music. Hmm. With the whole community of people there all gathered around them in these kind of sort of digital nightclub situations. And it's really saved a lot of people's uh, lives. Like, literally lives. And I get like, you know, you... you you, as, as you know full well, I get letters every day from people who say that this music has saved their life, who say that, that you know, that finding it. Well, it's a hell of a thing to have people tell you that it saved their lives. You know, I can never get over it. It, it hurts me when I hear that, I guess. I mean, it's yeah. in a strange way because it's, of course, I could hardly want anything more than that, you know, to be of that much help to people. But it speaks of a hunger that... Indeed. Well, yeah, that it that it's that it's required. Yeah, it's quite the thing, but yes. it is required, and that's the thing. It is required, uh, so that's why it's important that you know that we do these things. That's why it's important that you've done everything you've done. Why it's important that all of us, when we find that glittering thing, go have the bravery and ha and the awareness to to pay attention to that. And uh, and to step into that and follow where it might lead, and uh, and sometimes you will suffer incredibly for doing so. But to not do so, I think, would lead to far more suffering. That's a and really that, good place to end. Yes, and uh, I'd like to say thank you. As, hey, let's do this again. Yes. Happiness is fleeting, and suffering requires a sustaining meaning. Happiness is fleeting, and suffering requires a sustaining meaning. That place where the meaning and the fact are conjoined, that's the proper place to lecture from. What you want to do as an academic is tell your students about something that you've encountered that you've fallen in love with and to communicate the love that you have for that and not to say well you 
you should read this book but to say well here's this book and here's what it can open up for you and this is how it does it this is what you'll gain from it there's something in it that's of unbelievable utility and you have to believe that in order to communicate it to communicate that commitment you have to beauty and to truth and to literature it isn't enough to say what they are and to transmit them it's to manifest yourself as a living part of that tradition and to show yourself thereby as a model for living out what that tradition represents and to show that that's so much better than like a short-term pleasure-seeking nihilism. They're not even in the same conceptual universe. And people are far more open to that. They know already. People know, especially when they're hurt. They know that happiness is fleeting. And suffering requires a sustaining need. They know happiness is fleeting. Suffering requires a sustaining need. King's Chapel, the people who started it didn't live to see its completion. They were driven by this nobility of transcendent vision and they produced these enduring forms and out of the bloody misery of history. We've erected all this spectacular infrastructure that we're so fortunate to be part of. And none of that gratitude is taught. It's partly not taught because people have no sense of the absolute catastrophe of history. It's like nasty, brutish, and short. The simplest and most likely social circumstances. Catastrophe punctuated by hell. And to see that not happening in a sustained manner constantly and to see things improving around us and to be reliable in that manner and then not to be grateful for that, it's an unbelievable combination of ignorance, ingratitude and willful blindness. And to not instill that sense in young people for them to understand that they are standing on the bones of generations of people who suffered to make this possible despite all their errors and brought this forward. Happiness is fleeting. And suffering requires a sustaining need. They know happiness is fleeting. And that suffering requires a sustaining need. We could concentrate on building the future instead of criticizing the past. You start in the world if you have some wisdom and some humility by taking the potential that lies dormant in front of you and interacting with it in the Logos-like manner with truth and with love and by transforming that potential into whatever you can create out of it that's good. It won't be small if you do that. You can transform your whole household by transforming your room. You can transform your whole neighborhood by transforming your house. Like these things spread very, very rapidly. And that is right there in front of you. People think they're impoverished, that they don't have any opportunity. And the opportunity is hidden from them by their unwillingness to take the steps that are necessary to put what they could put in front of them in order and to produce the beauty instead of the ugliness where they could do that. And I don't think there is anything more powerful than that. That works. Happiness is fleeting. Suffering requires a sustaining need. They know happiness is fleeting. And that suffering requires a sustaining need. Happiness is fleeting. And suffering requires a sustaining need. They know happiness is fleeting. And that suffering requires a sustaining need. Well, here's a bomb for the suffering, and it's profound and deep. And here's what it's meant to me, and here's how you can incorporate it into your life. People are absolutely starving for that, or dying of thirst for that. 